Derivatives are the, obviously if you read it, it is not a derivative or the opposite of a derivative. So they're called antiderivatives. They could also just as well be called inverse derivatives, but the word anti was used. Uh, but these are basically underivatives or going the opposite direction. So we saw what a derivative functor did. It took a function to another function with a whole bunch of rules. So antiderivatives go the opposite direction. The problem is things like the anti-product anti rule are really complicated, and you won't learn that until next quarter. So the antiderivatives we do now are going to be relatively easy. So what we're going to do first is basically, well, I'll define what antiderivative is, and then we're just going to use intuition and figure out some of these. So we'll start out easy, and then slowly uh, crank up the difficulty. So we'll begin with definition. So we'll go capital F, so bit, ooh, big F of X is the anti-derivative of little f of x if so we don't want the two functions to be exactly the same what side does it make sense to put the derivative sign on so if big f is the antiderivative of little f does it make sense to put that on the little f side that would mean that big F is the derivative of little f. I want the opposite. So it's the antiderivative if I took the derivative and got to f. So what we want to do is think of a function who, whose derivative is the function that we're actually looking at. So that's our definition for now. Well, it's, that is the yeah, official definition. Now, we were going to look at some examples. So whenever I write anti-D, that's antiderivative. We're just going to be lazy. And I capitalize the D because it stands for a word as an acronym. Is that right? I don't know. It's a half acronym. A hacronym. So we'll start out fx equals 2x. So that's definitely a derivative you've seen before, what function has this derivative? So think about it for five seconds. Write it down if you can think of it. All right, who feels good about their antiderivative? What do you got? X squared. X squared. So this is what I call guessing and checking. Seems like it should be x squared. How do we know? What's the derivative of x squared? 2x. 2x. So write down what you think and then check. This is good because you basically have to be wrong twice. Your intuition has to be wrong, which it will be wrong, definitely, but then also, well, occasionally, it'll be wrong. And you want to check, so take your derivative. And you've taken derivatives before. So the checking part, you've done a lot. Or you should have done a lot. So we're doing guess and check here. So little g of x is cosine x, guess at the antiderivative. And I want you to check your antiderivative. So I'll give you 20 seconds here. Write down your guess. I'll give you a hint. This probably has something to do with sine. So write down your guess and then check and see if you're right. So what's the derivative of negative sine x? Cosine. Negative sine x. What's the derivative of negative sine x? Oh, cosine. Cosine. Negative, cosine. negative cosine x. So regular sine x is our antiderivative. So take a guess. You might be way off. If you wrote tangent down, hopefully you took your derivative and said, oh, no, that's definitely not going to work. 
uh, regardless of putting a negative sign in front of tangent. So sine x is the antiderivative of cos x. That's a little weird. It's, in my opinion, difficult to remember antiderivatives, so I just remember derivatives, and I do the guess and check method. So I know it's either sine or negative sine, and I just write the positive one down and then check it and realize, ah, oh, it is positive. All right, let's get crazy and go h of x, 2x plus cos x. So what is big H of x? And you want to think about this is the sum rule right here. So you should get the big F plus big G, or the x squared plus sine x. That's the antiderivative. And again, make sure you check, see if you're right. So those are some easy examples. If we do something less easy, So I of x is So what's a good guess for secant squared of 2x antiderivative? What function? has a derivative of secant, square, uh, secant squared. Tangent. Now, tangent of what? Probably 2x. Definitely 2x, so there's no other way to get 2 next to the x. So what do I get if I take our derivative of tangent 2x? All right, take this derivative and see what you get. And yeah, you have a chain rule going on, too. It's not a difficult chain rule, but you can't ignore it. So you get an extra times 2. So I'll write that 2 in red. I don't want that 2 there, so I can't just erase it. How do I, get, how do I remove the 2? properly. So I could divide everything by 2, basically. I got twice what I want, so I'll start out with half as much. So what I'm going to do to compensate for that 2 is do a divide it by 2. So i of x is now tangent divided by 2. And of course, that divided by 2 is a constant multiple right there. So it's not going to affect the derivative. So we'll go down to there. Now, <clears throat> this gets into what we call u-substitution, so we'll learn a technique that lets us find these antiderivatives a lot easier. You can't multiply by one half, can you? Yeah, I sure could. I don't know why. I usually multiply by a half. Every function well almost every function has an antiderivative. Every function you'll ever see will have an antiderivative. So I'm just gonna write every function has an antiderivative has has infinite So let's look at our first example. Can somebody think of another function whose derivative is 2x? x squared plus 1. What about another function? x squared plus 2. So how could I write down every function? Obviously, I'm not going to write 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. 
that would only be the integers and all the positive ones. So what we're gonna do is go plus, that should be a C, not an E. So for any constant C, so for any real number C. So C is a real number and constant. So the actual antiderivative, there's an infinite number of them. And what we do is just write a little plus C at the end. We take a derivative, that plus number just uh, goes to zero. So there's our uh, antiderivative. That's the general antiderivative right there, so all of them. And a particular So a particular antiderivative is when c is known. So if you know that value c, that's a particular antiderivative. Um, and you know this from the initial condition. It's generally going to be a point on the graph of the original function. So the point will look like a comma f of a on the graph of the original function. Now you don't actually need to draw a graph. If you remember back to pre-calculus one, a graph of a function is a lot of points. And it's points that look like a comma f of a where a is in the domain. And of course you can plot these on a Cartesian plane and get a picture. But the graph of function is really just a collection of points. Usually we would write as x comma f of x where x is in the domain. So all you need is one of those points and you know exactly which antiderivative that you're thinking of. All right, so why are there anti uh, infinitely many antiderivatives? Well, one reason we just saw if we compute, sort of algebraically, it makes sense. Now, if you think about <coughs> what, if you're thinking of a function and you want to find the antiderivative, you're finding a function whose, basically whose slope is described by the function you're thinking about. So if we think of that 2x function, we can graph this function out pretty easily. Now you want to be careful, this function has slope 2 everywhere. However, this function is describing the slope of big F. So what is the slope of big F at 0? It'll be the y value at 0. So the slope of big F at 0 is 0. What is the slope of big F at 1? The slope will be 2 right there. So the slope goes from 0 to 2. And what about the slope at negative 1? Negative 2. So <coughs> if we think about the antiderivative, and I'll switch colors, we'll go to blue. So let me draw the x squared plus 0 function. It's going to look like that. That is a slope 0 at 0. At 1 has a slope. It's a little hard to tell, but you'd have to do some calculus and find it has a slope 2. At negative 1, it would definitely have the negative slope of what it would have at positive 1, just looking at the way the graph's drawn. However, what happens if I do a vertical shift up or down? Does that change the slope at any of those x values? That doesn't. have the exact same slope if I slide this up or down. So that's why geometrically you can add a plus c. That's a vertical shift, which has no effect on the slope. Stretch is completely different. Stretch is definitely what changes slope. But vertical shift doesn't change the slope whatsoever. So that's why 
uh, geometrically that vertical transformation, the vertical shift, doesn't affect the antiderivative. So what does it take to figure out exactly what value of c that we're working with? You need one point on the original graph. So if I told you this red point was on the original graph, obviously c is not 0. So if that red point's on the original graph, the correct antiderivative we're thinking of would actually look like this. It would be shifted up 2. So you'd be able to plug that value in and figure out what is c. Differential equations is a scary word, but we're only going to do very basic differential equations. So we're going to solve equations that look like dy over dx equals f of x. Of course, you can rewrite this on the left side as d dx of y. So why is it called an equation? Because there's an equal sign. And why is it a differential equation? Because there's a differential in the front. So that's what makes it a differential equation. So how do you solve something like this? If we read it, so we're going to be given f of x. So we don't need to solve for f of x. What are we actually solving for? Are we so, so if we look on the second one, are we solving for ddx? That's an operator. We know what that is. So there's only one thing left. We're not solving for the equal sign. We're solving for y. So we're going to be solving these for y. So whenever you see it written solve, you're solving for y. So solve this for y. Test your derivative skills. This one's a little more tricky. And how do you solve this? You want to take the antiderivative on the right side. So take a guess, take your best guess, and then check. I made the x to the fourth coefficient not 5 on purpose. If it was 5, it would be a little too easy. Anybody feel good about their guess? All right, what power should x have in the first term? Five. So the anti-power rule. So we need to add one to the power. What do I need to multiply or divide by so when I take the derivative, I have what's above it? So I need to divide by 5 or multiply by a fifth. So there we go. Now when I take derivative, 5 cancels the fifth. And we got 3x to the fourth power. All right, what about the second term, cosecant squared? Do you remember your trig derivatives? Cotangent. Now it might be plus, it might be minus. So let's think, what's the derivative of cotangent? 
is negative cosecant squared. Is that right? Negative cosecant squared? I think it is. So to cancel that extra negative that's going to come in from the derivative, I need to do a minus. So the derivative of cotangent is negative cosecant squared. So this will be minus a negative cosecant squared, which is plus. What else do I need to write down? To write down all solutions. This is only one solution. Plus C. Plus C. So there's infinite solutions, so I need a plus C. And just looking at this, if you knew an x and a y value, you plug them in and get C right away. It's not hard to see that. So there's, there's three variables in there. Well, C is really constant, but three unknowns. You pl plug in two values, you'll get your third one uh, out. So let's do a physics example. So packages draw from a hot air balloon ascending at a rate of 12 feet per second at height 80 feet. Gravity has a downward acceleration. of 32 feet per second squared. How long does it take for the package to hit the ground? was our first one of our first things we did for word problems when we did related rates or what's a good first step to do on any word problem eventually we'll need to take derivative or antiderivative so write down stuff we know we need to figure out what's changing what do I need a variable for what do I not and maybe draw a picture so we'll start with our picture and then we'll write down uh, our variables so we have a hot air balloon that is going raising, ascending at 12 feet per second, and it's above the ground by 80 feet. So it's a height 80 feet. So draw some ground. Now the hot air balloon could be at any x coordinate. I think it makes sense to just put it right on the y axis. So I'll draw a hot air balloon. In physics, you draw everything as a point pretty much until you don't. So that'll be our hot air balloon. However that's supposed to look, basket, ropes, balloon. So package is gonna be dropped. So I'll use green for the package. How long does it take for the package to hit the ground? So how do we even know when this package is going to hit the ground? So we need some variable here. So if something's changing, that little green arrow, what is changing? The velocity will be changing. So the velocity would be the length or the magnitude of that arrow right there, but 
without worrying about that, what about the height? So let's think about the height. So we'll use y for the height. We're on the y-axis, so we'll use y for the height. Now is the height constant? No way. So that needs to be a variable. Now we get information about the ascending at a rate. So that's a velocity. You can just look at the units and also tell it's time. Uh, length measurement divided by time, distance over time. So that's a velocity. So I could use a variable v for velocity. So I'll write these over here. And we also get an acceleration. How are velocity and acceleration related to height? 